Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you guys today is a solved one, but it's one that some people think may not be as cut and dry as it seems. Some people believe that the person convicted for this murder was wrongly convicted. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what everybody thinks about that. But before we get into it, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Harry's. I've been using Harry's for years now and they're the only razors that I can use because they're the only razors that work with my very sensitive skin. Harry's high quality premium blades were manufactured in their own factory in Germany and are complete with a precision trimmer and a flex hinge to give you a close, comfortable shave. Not only are their blades amazing, but they have a new two-tone design that has deeper grooves for improved grip, which makes shaving just that much easier. Plus, the handles are made from 50% recycled plastic. I have the ocean blue color, which I think looks just so nice. I also use Harry's Foaming Shave Gel, which is perfect for those with super sensitive skin like I have. Their foaming shave gel is made with loving ingredients like aloe and hyaluronic acid. I swear by their razors and their foaming shave gel because they're the only razor and shave gel that I can use without ending up with some gnarly razor burn. Harry's is also super convenient, arriving in the mail at your front door so you don't have to spend the time going to the store just to get your razors. Harry's also offers a starter kit that gives you everything that you need for a close, comfortable shave. You will get your five blade razor, a weighted handle, a blade cover, and their foaming shave gel. The exciting news is that viewers of this channel can use my link down below and get your starter kit for only $5. That's harrys.com slash Rachel Shannon, and you can get everything that you need for a close, comfortable shave for only $5. Thank you again so much to Harry's for partnering with me on today's video and for your continued support of my channel. It's because of sponsors like Harry's that I'm able to continue making videos and keep spreading these very important stories. So with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the brutal murder of Karina Vitrano. Karina Ann Vitrano was born on July 12, 1986 to parents Philip and Kathy Vitrano. She grew up in Ozone Park, New York, and she had a brother and a sister. Karina attended the Archbishop Malloy High School in Queens, New York, and then went on to study at St. John's University, where she earned her master's degree in speech pathology. She worked with children who had disabilities such as autism. She was a kind-hearted woman who just wanted to give back. At the time of her death, she was living at home with her parents in their home in the Howard Beach area of Queens, New York. Her parents describe her as tough, motivated, and determined. She was vivacious and did everything in her life to live her best life. She loved traveling and had traveled all over Europe. She got a camel ride by the Great Pyramids and she hiked the Grand Canyon. She was known for loving to go out with her friends, often posting pictures of her nightlife, but she also loved running. This was her release. She had actually undergone surgery in her earlier life to her legs and the doctor told her that she may never run again but she pushed through and she continued running. Her father, Philip, described that she was so full of life, beauty, and power. When speaking of her daughter, Karina's mother, Kathy, wrote a poem. It reads, So fragile, my girl, a tiger, she rages, she roars in this world. Brilliant, resilient, powerful, dangerous, restless, and proud. The heart of a lion, the soul of a lamb. Karina, my baby, you shine and you love. She was a dreamer who loved writing poems and she even had a website where she would post her work. She actually had been an aspiring actress as well. She played a role in a short film based on her own poem called The Paradox. She had a friend who then turned the poem into a six-minute film. It was described as the story of two people, an angel and a sinner, each battling their own inner demons. They're opposites, but they may be more alike than it seems. Karina was very close to both of her parents, but especially to her dad, Philip. Back in 2016, the two of them did an entire cross-country road trip where they went to Arizona and went to the Grand Canyon. Then they ended their trip in LA attending a U2 concert. Philip had been a retired firefighter who had worked for the New York Fire Department and he was one of the first on the scene in the aftermath of the 9-11 attack. 
Something else that Karina and her father often did together was that they would often go on runs together. However, when 30-year-old Karina wanted to go on her evening run on Tuesday, August 2nd, her father was not able to join her like he normally did. That day, Phil was dealing with some back pain as a result of an injury that he had sustained earlier that summer. So, she went on the run by herself. She and her dad had a normal route that they always took together. She took a route along the Spring Creek Park in Howard Beach, Queens. It's a three-mile path that's pretty wide. It's been described as wide enough for a fire truck, and it's made of gravel, stones, and dirt. However, there is an area along Spring Creek Park that the locals know as an area that you shouldn't really go to alone. It's referred to the locals as the weeds because it's an area of undeveloped land that is overrun with tall weeds, litter, and people know around the area that sometimes there are unsavory characters that will hang out there. It's somewhere that teenagers are known to go to have keggers and ride around on ATVs, and then others will go out to the area to do drugs without the fear of being caught. Overall, this land is just not kept up with. There are certain areas of the park that are patrolled, but this specific area is not patrolled, and a lot of people know that it's just not the best place to be, and you definitely shouldn't go there after dark. But Karina would be running during the day. It was the evening, but it was still light out, and this was the same route that she always took. So, before leaving at around 5 p.m., she assured her dad that she would be right back. However, after she left, time started to pass and Karina stopped replying to her dad's text messages. He tried calling her several times as well, but she just was not answering. At this point, her father was starting to get really worried. Philip described that in this moment, he sort of just had this gut feeling that something was wrong. As more time passed without her answering his phone calls or text messages, Phil decided to take matters into his own hands. He went out and started searching around the path that he knew she always ran. Around the same time, he also contacted the police chief who he had known and who lived right down the street from the family. This man then contacted emergency services who went out there to search for her immediately. Pretty much right away, they were able to track her cell phone pings to a marshy area around 15 feet away from the path. So, of course, the searchers, along with Philip, all went out to search for Karina along this area, along the path that she was known to run pretty much every single day. And, unfortunately, it wasn't long before their searches would abruptly end with the worst possible case scenario. At 10.40 p.m., Philip, Karina's own father, had gone into the woods to continue searching, and there, he found her body. She was found lying on her stomach on the ground. Her right arm was under her, and her left arm was out to the side, with her hand clutching around the grass, indicating that she had been dragged. He said that her head was also tilted back to the side. She was found wearing only one sneaker. She was found with scrapes on her legs and her shorts and her sports bra were pulled down. She was found with her socks wet and her headphones that she wore every time she went on runs. They were missing. Phil said that her face had been beaten up so badly. Phil went on to say that Karina took great pride in her perfect teeth, but when he found her, her teeth just looked horrible at that time. Phil said that he knew in that moment that she was dead. And acting solely based off of emotion, he picked up his daughter's body, cradling her body, and he was screaming and wailing he knew that his beautiful young daughter was gone. Of course, after her body was discovered, it was sent off for an autopsy, and let me tell you, the findings are just horrific. She was found with a large extensive abrasion on her right buttock and the back of her thighs, a laceration to her vagina and her anus, there was bruising around her neck, and there were blood vessels that were burst in her face. She also had signs of being beaten to her face and her front two teeth were chipped. 
It was found that she had been brutally sexually assaulted and her cause of death was ruled as strangulation. It was also known that Karina had fought for her life as hard as she possibly could. The medical examiner said that she was found with linear scratch marks on her neck, which indicated that she was scratching to try and pry the attacker's hands off of her neck. Using this, investigators assumed that she had been running and then the attacker punched Karina in the face and then dragged her to the area where she would later be found. This is where it was thought that the attacker pulled off her clothes and then brutally raped her. Of course, this crime absolutely shook the community. Overall, it was a nicer area in New York that people felt safe in, and overall, in New York, they were boasting decreasing crime rates. But at this point, people were just terrified that this happened in this area of New York that had this very low crime rate, and it happened in daytime in broad daylight. Right away, police announced that they really didn't have any evidence to go off of, so they announced a $20,000 reward for any information that could lead to finding Karina's killer. They begged the public for anybody who had tips to please come forward and help solve this case. Now, this area is known to be where a lot of homeless people live and set up camp, so I'm referring to the area where she went jogging. Of course, police first went ahead and questioned the people who lived there. People told police that the weeds in the area are so high that you wouldn't even be able to see anybody on the path if they were running there. They also told police that it's just known to pretty much everybody that you just aren't supposed to go to this weeded area because of how high the weeds are. People who go there are known to use drugs and do other illegal things because of how secluded this area is. Another homeless individual reported that this area is also somewhere where planes fly pretty low, so the noise of that will drown out any noises of someone screaming or yelling or anything like that. Then another person questioned said that this is also an area where a lot of transients go. So they believed that the person who attacked Karina isn't necessarily somebody who lives there. It's not one of them, you know, people in this homeless camp that had set up there. It could have been somebody who was just passing through. Police also went ahead and found surveillance video that showed Karina running near a house at 5.46 p.m., and they combed through over 200 other surveillance videos in hopes of finding anything else that could lead them in any sort of direction. They also announced that they're going to test her cell phone for any forensic evidence such as DNA and fingerprints. They basically said that they're going to cut down every weed in that area until they are confident that they have every bit of evidence that is out there. Police, of course, started out by questioning everybody in Karina's life. It turned out that Karina had just broken up with a boyfriend two days before the murder, but he was questioned and he was quickly ruled out. They also asked Karina's father for his DNA and of course he was questioned as well because he was the one who found her body and all of that. One thing that I will note in this case is that at the trial that would later happen, he was given some flack for disturbing the crime scene when he found his daughter's body, but you cannot even blame him. All he did was pick up the body of his beautiful daughter who he had found dead and beaten. There's no way that he could have thought in this moment that he was going to be, you know, affecting a crime scene. He was just devastated. All he wanted to do was hold his daughter one last time and make her feel safe. But after that, after questioning everybody in Karina's life, police announced that they did not think that anybody who knew Karina personally was involved. They came to the conclusion that this was a random attack. They pled with the public to come forward with any tips because they just weren't getting anything. They told the public that there is still a danger to the community's safety because of the fact that this seems to be a completely random attack. They weren't really getting much in terms of tips, so they were begging for more. So after searching the crime scene more, they were able to locate Karina's other shoe. Like I said, she was found with only one shoe and the other shoe was found along the path. 
Like I said, the headphones were also missing and they found those as well. So they sent off the shoes and the headphones for DNA testing. They also found that there had been some DNA under Karina's fingernails from fighting off her attacker, and that too was sent off for DNA testing. About a month after the discovery of Karina's body, police announced that they had received about 85 tips, but these tips hadn't really led them anywhere. They also said that they ran this DNA that they found through a national DNA database, but they got nothing from this either. So, they went around and started collecting evidence from the homeless and transient people around the area so that this could be compared to the DNA that was found at the scene. At this point, the reward money was raised to $300,000 and I believe her family raised over $200,000 from a GoFundMe account. Then, Phil went to the media to plead to the killer to please turn himself in he said at the press conference that he know this man is tormented with what he did. He urged the killer to turn himself in, saying that the money from the reward would go to a family member of his choice. He even guaranteed that if he did turn himself in, that the money would go to a family member. And he said that if he turned himself in, that they would go easier on him. He said that this is his last chance to do what's right. By August 31st, 2016, police released a sketch of somebody who they believed could have been a witness to the murder. The police emphasized that this person is not thought to be a person of interest or a suspect. They said that the man was seen by utility workers and others in the area around the time that Karina was murdered. This sketch was described as being a black man with a beard, wearing a red t-shirt, dark pants, a wool cap, aged 35 to 45 years old, standing at around 5 feet 10 inches tall with a medium build. Something they emphasized was that people thought that it was strange that this man was wearing a wool cap in the middle of August when it was far too warm to be wearing such a cap, so that's what stood out to people about this man. By the time that year ended and 2017 began, Karina's case was beginning to grow cold. However, by January of that year, one of the lead detectives on Karina's case, Lieutenant John Russo, remembered that back on May 30th and 31st in 2016, he called the police to report a suspicious male who was wandering around his neighborhood in Howard Beach, Queens. In this 911 call on May 30th, he reported that he saw a suspicious male walking around the neighborhood with his hood up. He said that this man was just walking up and down the block wearing long sleeves and a hood, despite the fact that the weather was very warm. He said that the man had been walking around to people's yards and then looking at the yard and then walking away. He said that there were times that this man was walking slow and then he would all of a sudden start walking very fast. He said that this man had been doing this for about an hour. When police responded to the call and located the man, he told them that he was just looking around the area for a place to eat. So, police gave him a ride out of the neighborhood and to a McDonald's near this man's house. Then, the next day on May 31st, Russo found out about another 911 call that had been made by someone reporting a suspicious man who was holding a crowbar, and it looked like he was about to use the crowbar to commit a crime. Russo followed up on this call, and here he saw the same man that he saw the day prior, this time about seven to eight blocks away from his home. Although there wasn't a crowbar ever recovered, Russo sat in his own police cruiser and he saw the other officers respond to the call and stop this man and question him and frisk him. They didn't arrest this man for anything, but they did take down his name and his date of birth. Russo did not respond to comment on how he randomly remembered this incident, but like I said, he suddenly remembered this happening by January of 2017. So, because of this, he talked to officers who had stopped the man and asked them the name of the person they stopped, because again, he knew that they had taken down his name and his date of birth. So, the identity of this man was 20-year-old Chanel Lewis. After running his name, police found out that Chanel had three encounters with police since 2013, 
One was for public urination, and two were for breaking the rules at Spring Creek Park, but none of his offenses were ever that serious. He had no history of domestic violence or any sort of violence for that matter, nothing involving drugs or anything like that. It was just these two random incidences. But by February 2nd of 2017, he was taken in to the police station for questioning. At that time, police say that he was cooperating and he willingly gave them a sample of his DNA. But it turned out that Chanel Lewis's DNA was a match to the DNA found on Karina's phone, under her fingernails, and around her neck. So, by February 5th, he was taken in for questioning again, and after several hours of police interrogation, Chanel Lewis confessed that he was the one responsible for Karina's murder. He said that on that day, he was in a very bad mood when he saw Karina jogging on the same path that he was walking on. He said that in that moment, he just took his anger out on her. He said that he beat her to let his emotions out, but that he never really meant to hurt her. It sort of just happened that way. Now, it's been stated that Chanel had some sort of history of anger against women and that he just generally had this hatred against women. I also saw in one source that he attended a private school for children who experienced emotional and behavioral problems, so that sort of speaks to his history, I guess, of just maybe not being the most mentally well person. He said that on August 2nd, he was really angry because there was this neighbor who was always playing really loud music and was always hanging around with really loud friends, even though it was a quiet neighborhood. He said that he liked having a peaceful, quiet environment when he was home, but his neighbor was just always disturbing his peace. So, normally when he would get upset about this, he would go to the park and go on a walk. On this day, August 2nd, he did the same thing. He went over to the Spring Creek Park sometime that afternoon to go on a walk by himself and to just be alone and get some peace. He stated that on this day, he started playing his own music and he was just enjoying being in nature and being in peace. He said that as he was walking, that is when he saw Karina running towards him on the same path. He said that as she was running, he started by grabbing her and then she fell to the ground. Then he started hitting her in the face and in the mouth as she laid on the ground. He said that he pressed his knees into her shoulders as he was hitting her. He said that he hit her so many times and so hard that his knuckles started bleeding. He said that after hitting her about five times, he put his hands around her neck and started strangling her. Now, the next thing he said was a little bit confusing, but he said that as he was strangling her, I guess he either put her face down or she fell face down into the ground and into the water that was in a puddle that was on the ground. This was a little bit unclear. He said he did didn't put her face there, that she just sort of fell there, but I'm not exactly sure how that would happen logistically. But either way, he said that she wasn't moving once her face went into the water. He said that he was also using the water at this point to wash the blood off of his knuckles. He said that once she stopped moving, he grabbed her by her arms and then dragged her body off of the path and into the taller weeds. He said that after he had dragged her there, he said that her pants had been dragged down, but he believed that her sports bra was still intact when, you know, he left her there. He denied having anything to do with sexually assaulting her. He said that he did not touch her anywhere after or during or before strangling her. He said that he placed her body about 10 feet off of the path and into the weeds, and then he went back to the path and to see from where he was standing if he could see her, and he said from the path, you could not see where he put her body. Okay, so now I'm about to be reading you your rights. After that, if you agree to speak with me, you may, if you wish, make a statement about and answer questions about an incident that occurred on August 2nd, 2016. Even though I've already spoken to someone else, you do not have to talk to us. I'm going to now read you your rights. You have the right to remain silent and refuse to answer questions. Do you understand? Yes. Okay. 
Anything you do say may be used against you in a court of law. Do you understand? Yes. You have the right to consult with an attorney before speaking to me or to the police and to have an attorney present during any questioning now or in the future. Do you understand? Yes. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be provided for you without cost. Do you understand? Yes. If you, do, if you do not have an attorney available, you have the right to remain silent until you have had an opportunity to consult with one. Do you understand? Yes. Okay. Now that I've advised you of your rights, are you willing to answer questions? Okay. Yes? Okay. All right. All right. So now, why don't we start with, uh, I think it was a Tuesday evening on August 2nd, um, 2016. Do you remember that, that date and that evening? Mm-hmm. All right. And where were you at that time? Mm -hmm. okay. In at the Gateway and Spring Creek Mall. Okay, by Gateway and Spring Creek Mall. Uh, Spring Creek Park. Park? Yeah. All right. Were you inside the park? Yeah. Okay. And was anyone with you or were you by yourself? By myself. All right. About what time did you get to the park? About 5 o'clock. Now, while you were in the park, um, did something happen? Yes. What happened while you were in the park? While in the park, there was this girl jogging. And then I, then I, you know, one thing led to another because of some other situation. All right. Well, the girl that was jogging, was she by herself or with anybody else? By herself. Um, what did she look like? What was she wearing? Well, I going to say she looked like she was wearing a yellow tank top, maybe. And was she, was she jogging? Was she coming from the same direction that you came from when you entered the park? No, we were going opposite the directions. Okay. And when you first saw her, where were you? Were you in the grass or were you on the trail? On the trail. All right. And were you moving or you, were you standing still? Like I was moving, listening to music. You were, you were walking or jogging? Walking. And uh, you said as, as she got next to you, when she got next to you as, you as she was running and you were walking, what happened then? And then, you know, because of a past situation, I got angry and then started hitting her and stuff like that. Okay. Um, before you did, where did you hit her? Like in the face and like in the mouth. In the face and the mouth. Mm -hmm. Before you hit her, did you grab her or did you just hit her right away? Well, I kind of grabbed her first. Grabbed her? And like, how did you grab her? What part of her body did you, did you grab? Like I started hitting her because of the incident that was going on earlier. Right, uh, but did you, did you grab her before you started hitting her or it was the first thing you did was to hit her. What was the first thing you did? I grabbed her. And when you grabbed her, what happened then? And then I started hitting her and stuff like that. All right. Now, um, did you hit her with both hands? Probably, yeah. All right. <coughs> and what part of her body did you hit with your hands? I didn't hit any part of her body. Her face? Just the face. Just the face? All right. About how many times did you hit her in the face? Around five. All right. Was she standing when you started to hit her, or was she on the ground? She was on the ground. Okay. So did she? When did she fall to the ground after you grabbed her? All right. When when she, when she fell to the ground, and you were hitting her, was she on the pathway or was she off the pathway? She's kind of on the pathway. When you were hitting her in the face, was she face up or face down? She was like face up. Face up. Did she say anything at all? No, did she scream? <coughs> no, because her tooth broke. I'm sorry, her tooth broke? Right. Were you covering her mouth at all? Mm. No? Okay. Um, the tooth that broke, was it like in the front, the top or the bottom, do you remember? <coughs> no. Okay. <coughs> how long would you say you were hitting her for? About how, how long in time, I mean? The whole thing was like about five minutes. Five minutes, all right. And. Did you do anything else to her besides hit her? Did you put her hands on any other part of her body? No. Okay, up around her neck or anything? Yeah, there was kind of situation. I'm sorry? Yeah. You put her hands on her neck? Around her neck? Okay. <coughs> do you remember, was it one hand or both hands? Both. Both? All right. And how long did you have your hands around her neck? Did you squeeze her neck when you had your hands around her neck? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. You don't remember for how long, though? Mm. Okay. Because I was mad at the incident. 
You were mad about an incident. Okay, we're, we're going to get to that in a little bit, all right? I just want to find out what happened, all right? Was she still moving when you had your hands around her neck? Oh, yeah, and then she jumped into the water. Okay. Well, when you had your hands around the neck, was she on the ground or standing up? She was still on the ground. On the ground. Face up or face down? Face up. All right. And then how did her face go in the water? I uh, was strangling it. We were near the water, and then uh, I put her face in the ground. Okay. You were strangling her, you said? The water. And, and you she, put her face? No, she fell in the water. Okay. And then my hand was bleeding, so I went to wash off all the blood. Okay. Which hand do you remember? Uh, you just showed me your right hand, right? Your mm -hmm. right hand? Where was it bleeding? What part of the hand? Your knuckle? Mm -hmm. Okay. And when her face went in the water, was she face up or face down? Down. Down? Or face up. A face up? Yes. All right. Was the water covering her face? Mm hmm And how long did you hold her under the water? Oh, she didn't hold her under the water. When I came back, she was just... Oh, you didn't hold her under the water? Okay. Was she uh, was she moving when you put her face in the water? She was not moving. Okay. What do you remember? Was she still moving when you had your hands around her neck at all? Mm -hmm. How was she moving? What was she doing? Like she wasn't really moving that much. Okay. Did she um, try to hit you or <coughs> do it, touch your body a little during this time? Okay. What what, what did she do? Like try to scratch me. Okay. And um, did she scratch you? Where did she scratch you? On my face. Did she leave a mark or a scratch on your face? Yes. Mm hmm All right. So at, at some point before she went into the water, she had stopped moving. Is that right? Mm hmm She stopped moving before her face went into the water, correct? All right. Did, um... Kind of. I'm sorry. Kind of did. Kind of did? All right. I yeah. said, oh, at some point before she went into the water, she stopped <coughs> moving, and you said kind of, right? This, this is like after the, after the water. Well, that when when you when she went when you put her in the yeah. water was she still moving right, then? Yeah, in the water she fell in the she water. She fell. Was she moving then? After that she wasn't moving. Okay. Did yeah. she fall in the water when you first threw her to the ground, or when you're on the ground with her head in her? Did she like kind of move towards the water? It was more like a strangulation, and then she went into the water. So it was after you had your hands on her neck that she went in the water. Mm -hmm. All right. And what did you do then? After that. After that, she was just lying there, and then I got her by her ankles, and then picked her up by from from her back and put her in the bushes. You saw you were dragging her by the by the hands or the arms, right? Yeah. And when you dragged her, was was she facing down onto the ground or facing up to the sky? Up to the sky. Facing up. Okay. And where did you drag her to? It was somewhere off the pathway. Off the pathway? Mm -hmm. It's called weed and leaves. Weed and leaves. Okay. About how high would you say it was? Was it high or? Like. About, about eight, about eight feet, or something like that. Like higher than your head when you're standing. Yeah. All right. How far off the path did you would you th would you say you dragged her into the grass? Like how how many feet about? About probably about ten. Okay. When you got back onto the path, could you see her from where you were from the path? Mm -hmm. okay. When you left her in the grass, what were were her clothes still on? Was no. She, what, what was the um, st status of her clothing? How was how was her clothing? Kind of like pulled off. Pulled off. Yeah. Okay. What was pulled off? Like her clothes. Her shirt. Her pants. Her pants. What about her shirt? Sure. I think it was still up intact. Still so maybe. May okay. And when you say her pants were pulled off, were they totally off, or were they half on, or half off? What were they? Look like kind of half off. Okay. Um, were they down or up? I mean, her pants. Kind of like down. Okay. What about her underwear? Maybe it was down too. Okay. Did you um, touch her in any way in her, her vagina or her anus at all? Mm-mm. Not at all? Mm -mm. Okay. Now, you said that you did this because you had some anger. Is that right? Mm-hmm. All right. Can you tell me about that anger? Because, you know, I used to live in a different address. And I currently live right now. Right. And then there's sometimes there's this man that comes around there. He play like live music and carry a lot of friends around there. I didn't like it because I feel unsafe and comfortable. And I like my place private right. and peaceful. And usually I just 
Okay. Uh, what place was this that you used to live in? A different place. What place was it? It was the same neighborhood, but a different street. It was at Logan Street. The neighborhood where you live now? Yeah. And there was someone there who, who got you angry? Do you remember who that was? Do you remember who that was? Okay. Is your brother? Do you have any brothers? Uh, yeah, I have a brother, but <coughs> he don't live with us no more. Did that particular person, you don't have to tell us who he is, but did he, did he make you angry that day on August 2nd, that Tuesday? Yeah, because like every, every day he keeps playing the music and inviting his friends and know we're just living in a quiet block. Mm -hmm. and we don't like all of these type of stuff. What time was that that he was playing the music and got you annoyed and got it's you angry? Pretty much, yeah, pretty much all day. All right. And what time, <clears throat> when did you leave your house to go to that park that day? I probably left about, about 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock. In the afternoon, early afternoon? Yeah. Usually I just go to the industrial place and then go to um, the mall and then go, go across the bridge. And how far into the park did you walk when you, had you walked when you first saw um, the girl? I walked to one trail and then went to the next trail. Okay. Had you ever gone to that park like before this date? Would you go there on, on occasion? Or? Yeah, sometimes when I, was, when I get angry and stuff like that. How many times would you say you've been there before to the park? Like several times. More than three, four times? Yeah. Okay. Would you always go into the park by that trail? Yeah. Like last night, you, didn't, you, didn't, you really didn't want to talk about this, right? Last night. But today you, it was okay. You wanted to talk about it, right? Mm -hmm. I know that you told um, Detective Brown you wanted to straighten your life out, right? Yes. Okay. And then Detective Brown said to wait until you came in the room to talk about it, that's right? Mm -hmm. And that's what you did, right? Yes. Okay. After making this initial confession, which was recorded as we saw, he confessed again to two assistant DAs saying basically the same thing. At the end of the confession, it was said that Chanel asked them, so the two assistant DAs, about enrolling in some sort of rehabilitation program. It was said that at this point, Chanel actually believed that the man that he confessed to was his lawyer and not the prosecuting attorney. After examination, police did confirm that he did have an injury on his hand, which is consistent with what you would get if you were punching someone really hard. Chanel was arrested and taken into custody on charges of second-degree murder, and here he was held without bail. Of course, during this time, police went in and searched the home that Chanel Lewis lived in. They found a cell phone that was believed to be his in the dresser drawer within his room. They found on this phone that there were 137 searches that took place on his phone that was related to this case that happened before Chanel was ever taken into custody or questioned in relation to this case. So meaning these searches were made before he ever knew that he was being looked into. Investigators said that among the searches on his phone, they found in the cache data, they found two photos of Karina on the phone photos that are commonly used in articles about Karina. So I believe these were downloaded to the data. He didn't necessarily save them, but it showed that he had clicked and looked at these pictures. They also found photos of the crime scene as well, which showed officers standing around the area where Karina's body was found. Once again, they weren't necessarily saved to his phone. It just showed that he had clicked on and looked at these pictures. Either way, they also found other searches relating to constitutional rights about the legal process in the US. The user had also searched for Google terms such as arraignment. The user also looked up articles relating to familial DNA testing. Now, before Chanel was ever taken in and questioned for the murder, before his DNA was ever, you know, connected to the murder, at this point, again, as we know, police were having a lot of trouble finding any evidence that they could use to catch the person responsible. So, it was announced by the DA that they wanted to start looking into using familial DNA testing to catch Karina's killer. So, that is how this connects to the searches being found on the phone for that same DNA testing. Because again, if this person was following this case and they found that they want to start using familial DNA testing, 
the killer might want to find out what that is to see if that means that there's a possibility of him being caught. Then on the phone, there was a photo of a hand that showed a hand injury. Once again, Chanel said that he punched Karina in the face multiple times and injured his hands, and police confirmed that Chanel did have a hand injury but there wasn't a face in the picture or any other way to identify who the hand technically belongs to. But obviously all of this to say that the person's hand in the photo is thought to be Chanel's and the Google searches were also thought to be done by him. So the trial for murder started in November of 2018 for multiple charges, including rape and second degree murder, and Chanel was now pleading not guilty. During the trial, the prosecution brought forward the evidence that we had discussed earlier. I'm going to go over each part of evidence now and then what the defense had to say about each thing. So when it comes to the confession, the jury did get to see the entire clip, but the defense said that this confession was made after several hours of intense police interrogation. He made the confession because he was coerced to. He was taken into questioning on February 4th at around 5 p.m., and once he was taken into the station, he actually refused to answer questions about the murder initially. The detectives were coming in and out of the room every few hours, coming back only to ask him if he wanted to talk about the murder, and initially, he said that he didn't know anything about the murder. For the first several hours that he was there, he did deny having any involvement. By 10.45 p.m., Chanel was then led to a cell to sleep in the police station for the night. He said that he had a lot of trouble sleeping that night. He said that he was very much a homebody and he didn't have a normal childhood where he would go to friends' houses and sleep over or ever go on trips without his parents. He said that this night, the night that he was at the station, this was the first time that he had ever spent the night away from his parents. Then they said that the next day at 5.50 a.m., Chanel had not yet spoken to a lawyer or his parents for that matter. It was only at this point, after he was very tired, after a sleepless night, and after several hours of police interrogation, that he actually began to confess. The defense said that in the confession, he didn't give police any information that wasn't already known to the public. They argued that this seemed like a narrative that had been fed to him. As you saw in the video that I played for you, I will admit that the officer did seem to be asking him leading questions. They didn't just let him sit down and tell his story. The officer was asking a lot of questions to get more details and to sort of put the story together rather than letting him just sit there and like give him a timeline of everything that he did to her. The defense argued that people don't just snap like this. They said the story of him being mad at his neighbors for playing music and that is what led him to snapping and just killing this young woman that this story just does not seem plausible. They also brought up how Karina had been violently sexually assaulted, yet Chanel didn't confess to anything relating to a sexual assault. He claimed that he did nothing to her other than hitting her and strangling her. They also argued that he wasn't read his Miranda rights before he made the confession either, so the confession should have never been allowed for the jury to see. Then they brought forward the DNA that had been found. Initially, it seemed that the NYPD made it sound like the DNA came from her neck, her back, her phone, and from under her fingernails. However, the defense said that his singular DNA only came from her phone, her neck, and her back, but the DNA that was under her fingernails was actually a mixture of multiple DNA profiles. They also said that rather than the nail DNA being confirmed as being his DNA, the medical examiner only said that it couldn't be ruled out that his DNA was under her fingernails. So this is a lot less like cut and dry as the NYPD wanted you to think it was. They also said that there was a bottle of Arizona fruit punch found 
found at the crime scene and they said that there was DNA on this bottle that was from a completely separate individual. They also brought up how the crime scene was contaminated when Phil held his daughter's body. They said that understandably, the father of the victim is just going to react like this and he's going to want to hold his daughter close but in doing so, he made the crime scene less reliable. They also argued that DNA can sometimes end up in places that the person has never been to. They said that maybe Karina touched the same surface as Chanel at some point, and that is how small amounts of DNA could have transferred onto her body. So, the defense argued that the fact that police assumed that the attack was committed by one individual gave them tunnel vision that led them to making a series of assumptions to piece together what happened. So, the fact that there was other DNA found and that it wasn't matched to anybody else but is known to not belong to Chanel that is concerning for them. The defense also had arguments relating to the Google searches that were allegedly made on his phone. They said that based on the software on his phone, it only shows the websites that he ended up on, not necessarily what he typed in to the Google bar. So, for example, if he had been browsing under the true crime tag in the New York Times and happened upon the article and then clicked on it, then that could lead to the article showing up on his phone history. It doesn't necessarily mean that he searched for Karina's name or for the crime scene. It can reasonably be assumed that this man found out about a murder that took place in a park that he frequented and that a beautiful young woman was the victim and that just led to him being interested in the case. It definitely can happen to anybody. If you found out that somebody is murdered near your own home, of course you might want to look into it and see if an article will pop up, and that is what this can be chalked up to. Then, when it comes to these articles about the familial DNA testing, this was also something that was talked about in the news. So, once again, he could have just come across the article and then clicked on it and read it because he was curious. This information could be found on pretty much anybody's phone around the area. People who found out about this young woman who went missing, then they found out that familial DNA testing might be used and they just wanted to know what that was to see if this case was going to be solved. Because again, police did announce that there was a danger to the community, so maybe people were just keeping up with this case to see if, you know, the case would be solved so that they could feel more safe and comfortable in their own neighborhood. The prosecution also, of course, brought forward the photo of the hand with an injury on it that was found on Chanel's phone. They said that this photo was taken right after the murder, and it was confirmed that the day after the murder, Chanel did actually receive medical treatment for a hand injury. But of course, the defense argued that the hand in the photo may not be Chanel's, the photo doesn't make it clear who the hand belongs to, so there's no way to definitively say that this was Chanel's hand injury. The other thing relating to the hand injury that they said was that the injury would have prevented him from first dragging her body as far as he said he did. Then it was stated that Karina's cell phone was found about 40 feet away from where her body was and the assumption was, was that it was thrown there. So, the defense argued that this hand injury would have prevented Chanel from throwing her phone that far. The defense also brought into question the aspect of race in this case. So, when police were originally going around and collecting DNA evidence, they used phenotyping technology to determine that the person's DNA that was found belonged to a black male. For those who don't know, phenotyping is a pretty cool way of using DNA technology to figure out the nationality of the person and figure out a general idea of what the person may look like just based on their DNA. But they said that because of this, police were only really collecting DNA from black males, which can be seen as racial profiling. They said in total, they had actually collected DNA from over 300 black men before finding Chanel. Then, the 911 call made by Russo was also brought into question. 
As I stated before, Russo was one of the lead detectives on Karina's case. It has been stated many times that, you know, people will see a black person just minding their own business and because of implicit bias and racism, white people will call into the police and report the person as being suspicious just because they are a black person existing in, you know, a more white area. This is something that happens in mostly white neighborhoods way more often than it should, and you won't be surprised to know that Russo did live in a mostly white middle-class neighborhood. So, they questioned his 911 call. Was it made because of racial profiling? Why did he call 911 to report some black man just walking down the street minding his own business? In trial, he basically said no comment to a lot of the questions regarding if he had ever called 911 regarding a black person walking around before or if he had any sort of racial bias. However, he did explain himself in saying that this man wasn't just walking around. Like I said earlier, he was wearing long sleeves and a hoodie when it was clearly hot outside. He was looking around at people's houses and yards and then would walk slow one second and then would speed up and walk fast the next second. And that is why he saw this person as suspicious. Obviously, with the second call that was made by somebody else, we can't really question this that much and neither did the defense because he was reported as having a crowbar, which why do you really need to be walking around with a crowbar anyways? But either way, they did question all of this and they argued that race may have played a role in his arrest because again, we have this lead investigator who called 911 to report a black man as being suspicious for walking around the neighborhood in his, you know, middle class, mostly white neighborhood. The same lead detective also collected DNA from over 300 black men who are thought to have been involved in the crime because of the phenotyping. So, does this mean that he has this racial bias or does it mean that that's just where the investigation led them and maybe this man was being more suspicious than people think when he was walking around the neighborhood? There's no way we can really say. As far as I've seen in relation to this case, there's never been anything stated that he had any sort of other, you know, run-ins like this, but just keep that in the back of your mind as we go throughout the rest of this case. Then, obviously, going back to the trial, we know that the prosecution argued that he made this confession completely unprompted. They said that the DNA evidence that they have is solid, that there's no reason for his DNA to be anywhere on her body, let alone under her fingernails. Then, obviously, the searches on his phone just do not look good for him. After hearing both sides by November 20th, 2018, the jury went into their deliberations. They deliberated for a day and a half, I believe about 13 hours. During their deliberation, they went to the judge multiple times to request different pieces of evidence to look at. They wanted to see more about the examination of the DNA and they wanted to see the confession tape again. But after all of this, they came back to the judge and told him that they were deadlocked. They were completely split on whether or not to convict Chanel Lewis on murder and rape. So, Chanel's lawyer requested a mistrial, saying that granting the jury another day to deliberate isn't going to do any good, and this request was granted. So, this trial ended in a mistrial. The retrial started on March 17, 2019. The prosecution this time made sure to discuss further details about any evidence that was called into question during the first trial. The prosecution insisted that the crime scene was taken care of even though her father came in and held her body. They said that the physical evidence was not disturbed and that the DNA evidence should be taken as what it is. DNA doesn't lie. DNA does not mislead. DNA is just there. It's placed there because this person either touched them or touched something that was related to them and on their body. So, that is something that they said just could not be argued. They also argued in relation to, you know, the defense saying that Chanel was pressured and that he was only confessing because he was coerced to. The prosecution argued that Chanel was treated with respect and while being held, they allowed him to eat and watch cartoons while he was in his cell. 
They argued that the police did anything that they could to make him as comfortable as possible given the circumstances. They said that this confession did not come under distress, nor did they feed him any details. The defense argued basically the same things in this trial that we discussed for the first trial, calling the DNA into question, arguing that the confession was coerced, and then talking about everything related to the phone and these searches. They also, of course, brought up the factor of racial bias when investigating this crime. After hearing both sides, the jury went into deliberation once again, and this time, they did come back with a verdict. They found Chanel Lewis guilty on charges of sexual assault and second-degree murder, and by April of 2019, he was sentenced to life in prison. To this day, Chanel still says that he did not commit this horrible crime, and his family still believes that he is innocent. After the verdict was read, supporters of Chanel all waited outside of the courtroom and chanted justice for Chanel. They said that Chanel had been lynched in a sentence imposed by a racist judge. As the lead prosecutor on the case walked out of the courtroom, Chanel supporters yelled, shame on you. They believe that this is yet another case of a wrongly accused black man. Chanel's mother, Veta Lewis, said that in her heart, she knows that her son is innocent. She believes that after months and months of finding no evidence to this case, that police planted evidence to finally get a conviction of someone and that Chanel was just the victim of this. On the other hand, Karina's family, they do believe that they have the right man. They said that he is a clever and remorseless criminal, not the emotionally challenged, innocent young man that the defense portrays him as. Karina's mother says, quote, the vacant expression you show is mostly a reflection of your empty soul. So, that is where the case sits today. There are a lot of people who believe that Chanel Lewis was wrongly convicted. They believe that his confession was coerced and that the DNA evidence is not as solid as they would like you to think it is. Me, personally, I can see how somebody could look at this case and think that there is racial bias in play here. The fact that one of the lead investigators called the police about a man who was walking around the neighborhood, the fact that they did only collect DNA from black males based on the phenotyping, all of those things definitely can be looked at as very suspicious and be seen as an aspect of racial bias in this case. I will say, in my opinion, I do think that there is too much evidence to say that Chanel is innocent. I personally do think that he is responsible for the murder, given the fact that he had this hand injury and got treatment for it the day after her murder. The fact that his DNA was found on her body and couldn't be ruled out as being found under her fingernails. The fact that he frequented this park and the fact that he confessed to it. All of those things, I really do think that he did commit this murder. But at the same time, there are certain things that I do understand that maybe shouldn't have happened. I think that even though this phenotyping did show that a black male may have been responsible, they should have collected more DNA from more individuals because you don't necessarily know that this DNA specifically is the DNA from the perpetrator. She could have bumped into somebody. Could have happened that she knew somebody who was a black male that the family didn't know about. So I do think the fact that they only collected the DNA from black individuals based on the phenotyping was not the best move here. I think they should have just focused on pretty much everybody and not ruled anybody out, especially not based on race. I also don't know what to think about this phone call, this 911 call that was made by Detective Russo. Part of me is obviously happy that it happened because that led them to finding out his name and led them to being able to pin down this murderer. But at the same time, this just brings a bigger issue into question. The fact that, you know, people are just sitting in their houses and seeing a black male walking down the street and thinking that he looks suspicious because he has a hood up. I do know that his family is from Jamaica, so they're probably very used to the heat all of the time. 
Maybe it was rainy. Maybe it wasn't as hot as, you know, he thought it was. Maybe he just wanted to wear a hoodie that day. There's really no reason to question what someone is wearing based on the weather. We all see those random people that walk around with t-shirts and shorts when there's literally a blizzard outside. So the fact that he's wearing a hoodie shouldn't have been enough for him to call 911. Again, we don't know the situation. He could have been, you know, walking up to people's houses, looking in their windows, and then running off. We don't know. I don't know. I don't want to make excuses for this person making this 911 call. It definitely is weird. It definitely could show racial bias and implicit bias. That definitely could have played into the investigation of this case. But at the end of the day, I do think that they found the murderer of Karina and I do think that her family can sleep well at night knowing that the person responsible for murdering their beautiful, beautiful young daughter is behind bars and will hopefully stay there for as long as possible. But once again, there is still questions as to whether this truly is the person. I said what I think, but now I want to know what you guys think. Do you think this is a case of tunnel vision and them just assuming that Chanel is responsible based on these things? Or do you think the evidence really does point to him and make it beyond reasonable doubt that he was the man who killed Karina? Let me know this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and give this video a thumbs up and subscribe. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you go ahead and use my link down below and head to harrys.com slash Rachel Shannon to get your starter kit for only five dollars make sure you go ahead and follow me on twitter and instagram both will be linked down below and if you have absolutely any case suggestions please make sure to go ahead and fill out the google form that i have listed down below with that i hope you guys have an amazing week stay safe stay healthy and i hope to see you next time bye